All righty. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're coming in from. We're so excited to be back today for our Thursday nap week excitement. We have so many things going on this week. We hope that you've been able to take advantage of everything. And I'm very excited too to start today with our Cultural Competency Council. Some of our members are here with us today. And I just want to introduce everybody and say thank you so much for joining us. So if anybody doesn't know much about the Cultural Com Competency Council, NAP created this a couple of years ago in regards to being able to better meet the cultural competency needs, not just of the people that we serve, but also the people that are members of our organization. And so I'm super excited to introduce you to a couple of our members here today. We have Pam Hale that ha comes from Minnesota and Diamond Boone in New Jersey. So we're very excited to have both of you here. And of course we have Colleen Knutson here today who is our, our uh, one of our ex officio members of the NAP board that meets with the Cultural Competency Council and just advises and works with them as they move forward in creating the opportunities that are, are available for um, any of our members or their are people that they do serve and so welcome everyone thank you so much for being here today we appreciate you and i think it's super exciting because today we are also going to be doing a special drawing at the end this was one that you had to register for so we won't be taking any names or anything on the the live today but this one is the engagement premier bundle this is a six thousand dollar membership that will be for one year so one winner is going to win this and this will give you access to the following organizations spira 100 coral health memory bio fotavia one day university and discover live so you will have this bundle of engagement opportunities so the lucky winner will be announced at the end of our time today and again it's great. It's nap week. We're all about innovating, inspiring, and involving. And so let's talk a little bit more about the Cultural Competency Council. Let's just jump right into it. And, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about how cultural competency really affects activity programming. And let's take it even deeper and talk about this innovation, involving, and inviting, you know, and being involved with diversity and inclusion. What does that look like in regards to our activity programming? I think one of the first things you want to do is really think about what cultural competence is. And I know that there's some different definitions for that, but it's really when an individual can really understand and respect the values, the attitudes, the beliefs uh, from across a lot of different cultures. And then it's also how do they respond appropriately to the differences that are needed for planning, implementing, evaluating these activity and recreational opportunities or programs or interventions. And so for activity professionals and rec therapists, uh, we are creating activities to meet the dimensions of wellness and to improve quality of life. So to do that, we need to know who's living in our facility. Who are they? Uh, which we'll talk about this a little bit, but it means assessment. It means relationship building, care planning, or if you work in an AL, ISP planning. But it's meeting the needs of all of the residents, providing spaces and planning assistance. And then in my mind, also educating others, such as the staff and the other residents in the building to the differences in the cultures that you have. You, you said something that was super important that I just want to touch on just briefly, and that's getting to know the resident. And I think that is one thing that we sometimes get involved in the hustle and bustle of everything that's going on in our job descriptions that we fail to really get to know that resident and yeah. understand what their culture is, you know, and, and realizing that in order to have like quality engaging programming it's going to have to include that person as an individual and it's going to have to meet that so let's think about that how how would we do that more how would we do that better you know how do we plan and implement like effective programming for that underrepresented groups that are in your facilities yeah so i i think simply as colleen was just saying we really ask the resident and make it person-centered what do you want to do what how does this look like in your culture and instead of us trying to you know um gather ideas of our own that's coming from our own ideas and own cultures that wouldn't be appropriate to make it culture sensitive and culture appropriate we should really be asking the resident what they want to do so very similar to person-centered care but also being very sensitive um, about what what uh, their culture and, and what impact their culture may have um, in the programming. Hmm. I think, thank you so much for bringing that up too. 
up to the knowledge that we need to have. And I know there's the regulatory language now, we call it culture sensitive, and you talked about that. So, you know, what is that, you know, let's break it down a little bit further, you know, when we talk about activity programming, what does that mean? And then how do we apply it? What do we do? I think cultural sensitivity, and it was interesting, they actually wrote that into the state statute in Minnesota for assisted living. And so everybody, mm -hmm. well, what does that mean that we have to provide mm -hmm. cultural sensitive programming? Um, and I think it starts with cultural knowledge, cultural intelligence, because you need mm -hmm. to know something about someone's culture before you can sensitivity to so there's that that's the knowledge piece and then the sensitivity is something you develop within yourself to really reach out to that resident and um you know i work in facilities with um very diverse populations and so we actually did some training um we had an east african unit um and you know just even within the somalian culture that culture was very different and so we had a um, East African social worker come in and do training with our staff. So then you know a little bit more about the culture. You have that cultural intelligence, but you still have to develop the sensitivity part. And I had to always kind of remind people, you know, even now you still need to go in and build a relationship with that resident because how they experience their culture will be different from you know, resident to resident, just like we all experience our cultural difference. So it's kind of what Diamond was saying, how do you keep that individuality, but yet still build programs and respond to what you know is important to them, you know, their their norms, their culture, what they like to do, that sort of thing. So um, to me, it's, it's a process. It's not yeah. just wanting to do that, not just being a good understanding person, but you need to have some strong knowledge base. And then you know, put our assessment skills into good use the way that we always do. Um, so it's always a two-step process as far as what I have learned in trying to be more culturally sensitive. I think you yeah, both, I, yeah. I'm, Go I'm ahead. Sorry, that's such a good point. It's easy for us to think um, I have people's best intentions in mind and I'm trying to help and I'm doing this because I care and that's a piece of it, but we need to see it through the lens of the person where it is their culture, like really they're the ones that are helping to educate us. It's not us determining what is best for them. Yeah, I think cultural competency, I know many states now have, you know, and I know with federal regulatory compliance, if you're working and skilled, of course you have to, you're mandated to do some cultural competency, some form of training, right? And I think a lot of times, you know, that training is just really the basics. It's just hitting that that layer and and sensitivity takes it just that step further. You know, I was I was trained in what we call cultural humility practice, which refers a lot to sensitivity. That it is a lifelong learning process. That we all have we all have our own biases and we all have our own struggles. And so sometimes we have to recognize that bias and realize that some we may be exhibiting that bias when we're working with our clients and our residents. And so we have to check ourselves. You know, we have to be like, oh wait a minute. You know, I need to. Like, like you said, Colleen, look at it through the eyes of the resident and see, you know, where they're coming from and what, what they're, you know, working with and how they're feeling. And, and, you know, not necessarily that you have to like, oh, you know, kind of thing, but just being aware and being sensitive to that is the key to creating a better relationship. And thank you so much for pointing that out. And I know, you know, as we look at with skilled nursing, especially we have, you know, health literacy and social isolation. That's a big one. I have seen so much. I've been, you know, working with some different, I'm a consultant as well. And I work with all these different facilities and we're having issues with these residents that are at risk for social isolation, you know, and how, are, what are we doing about that? And this new MDS focus areas that we're looking at really integrate this cultural competency or at least a cultural understanding. And so how, how can we work with that? How can we, how does health literacy and social isolation help us with that? I think, you know, the health literacy question that was a new item on the MDS um, this fall is part of what CMS is calling their um, equity practices initiative. So they're trying to, and, you know, it makes sense. They're starting with an assessment. If our assessments don't provide for equitable health education and practices, you know, how can we get there? Um, they're calling it their ethnicity, race, and language cultural starting point. So this question really is about language and how 
you know, the ability that people have to understand health systems. Um, and when I look at, you know, someone who says never, um, you know, it also to me might indicate an access issue. Mm -hmm. You know, if they never had healthcare or they had inconsistent healthcare because the providers were not regular, they didn't know them, they didn't know their culture. Um, you know, they, you know, don't understand, um, you know, and they don't understand the practices of healthcare. So that was the point of that. Um, and I think, you know, it'll get better as we, you know, that's just one question. I don't think it's, you know, getting us to the point that where we want to be, but it's a good start at looking about um, language access, health literacy, um, and then how, how do we tailor our services? around that knowledge, you know, again, it's always, I think, goes back to the more knowledge we have about cultural differences, how healthcare has affected people. We know many people have had very negative experiences in the health system. You know, we know when during COVID, people of different ethnicities did not get good care. They did not get the same access to vaccines. So it's a, it's a step in a process. Um, and, you know, for activity professionals, what does that mean? Well, if they can't um, read a health brochure or they haven't had, you know, education around health issues, are they going to understand when you want them to come to a physical exercise class, you know, to build muscle strength and things like that? Um, so it's it's a step in, in the process. I think it's was a, it's an important piece. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, I mean, we're only what, three months in, three or four months yeah. into the new MDS. So what does that really change? Um, you know, what, hopefully in a year from now, we'll have some better data um, and some better systems around that data. Mm, yes, and that's true. And it's a shame that it's taken this long, right? I mean, here we are so far into, you know, healthcare and, and regulatory compliance. What, 1986, seven is when that all came out. And here we are. Still, you know, almost 40 years later, we're just now getting to that and still learning. And I think that's the thing is, you know, as everything is a learning process when we think about that. So how do you learn about the residents' culture through the assessment process? What are some things we can do? I'm happy to jump in there. I sure. We really, we just have to have an assessment that includes everything about a person's culture from attitudes and belief and religion and their thoughts on medication and um, and on visitors and what they eat and when. I mean, the assessment needs to be very, very thorough um, because we only know what we know and we need to ask all of these questions if we're going to learn about them and be able to support them and what is now their home. And then we need to educate the rest of the staff, the rest of the team to get them on board as well. It's no good if one person does the assessment, does a care plan, and it's not regularly looked at or reviewed or shared with other people. We all need to sort of be on the same team to, to provide this all-encompassing care. Yeah. And I think yeah. along with that, Colleen, we have to be really open. I think sometimes activity professionals get scared. Well, oh, they're not going to very many programs. They're not doing this. They're not. Yeah. Because what might be a good, meaningful daily routine um, for someone from a different culture may look very different than what we are used to providing. Um, it may not be programmatic. It may be about what TV channels do you offer? What kind of interpretation services do you have? Um, obviously, how do, how do they practice any of their spiritual beliefs is really important. But, you know, it, it won't be the traditional programming that is important. But, you know, I think we're, we're really going to have to change around what we think is a therapeutic activity care plan. Um, so because it could look really extremely different for that person. And that's OK. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be about how many groups they came to and how many contacts right. they had, as long as we can provide an environment within an institutional setting that has pleasure for them that has some semblance to their lifestyle their routines that sort of thing and it might be um by doing that depending on how diverse of a group you have concurrent programming where there's multiple small groups at the same time or setting something up for someone to do individually or a special volunteer i think we're really going to have to utilize as many resources we can so that we can provide these things to people 
Mm-hmm. And I also think being on the same page with the um, the care team. So like your administrator, the nurses, the dietary, especially because when you do those um you know, MDSs in the acts about food, that is very important to a person's culture. So really just having open communication with all staff and all leadership within the building about how can we best support this individual or support these groups of people to ensure that they really have great quality of life through um, being culturally sensitive. And I think too, thinking in terms of what things um, really tie them into their community now that they're (laughs) out of it, whether it's for a short-term stay, long-term stay, a simple thing that we had to do was, um, again, in the small land community, they have a cable TV station and everybody went to that for everything, all their information. Well, we had to put up a different satellite in our big downtown building and spend a little money, but they all, that was their daily check-in. Um, and so it was really important for them to have that connection to their community. I love that. Natalie, the, hi, Natalie. Natalie from, from our UK, our UK division. She okay. says, for a lot of activity providers, they are worried about the correct use of language. What is okay? I always say it's better to ask and let someone support you in gaining the knowledge. Some people love to share their culture and history of their community and the best starting places. Could you tell me or share with me? And I think that is so important too. It's just so simple, you know, to, to just ask the question. And she also continues on to say, you know, life stories really help to start that process when you're asking the life stories. So thank you, Natalie and hi. She says hello to everybody. So thank you so much for being here with us. And, you know, that kind of leads us into that next conversation I want I want to talk about is the visual or any cueing that we do. What do we do to indicate that our community is a safe and inclusive environment? What should we do? I think the most important thing is that you hire individuals who are, you know, of different backgrounds or different cultures. That's where the representation starts. It helps when a resident is represented by or is familiar with someone in the facility that looks like them, that comes from the same culture. Um, We have to ensure that we are employing these buildings with diversity Um, and from people of different languages, different backgrounds, um, you know, with people with disabilities. I think it's very important that we hire these individuals because as they are really represent our building, our facilities, and most importantly, the residents. Um, so I, I think that makes it a safe place if uh, we all are different and we, and we all bring something different to the table. It really opens up um, for the residents to communicate and it stops a lot of the stigmas that people have against um, you know, different um, you know, populations. So I think it's very important to start there. Because the okay. facilities culture is really created by the people who are there in it. And so you're right, having that diverse staff. And and I think, and that's part of why the Cultural Competency Committee is trying to offer scholarships. Um, Having those people of diverse cultures, ethnicities in your building as employees, but then also having them in leadership positions so that your entire community can grow and see the the value and and know um, that we all have capacity. Um, I think, and, you know, helping people get to that point, I think is something we need to do. Mm. Yes, having the right individuals instead of necessarily maybe just putting up a flag or a poster or a flyer to say that you're doing something to being culturally, to be culturally sensitive. Yeah, people are going to make the biggest difference. I love that because I remember when I started working in healthcare, if somebody was different, or, you know, had a tattoo or a body piercing, they were made to cover it up, right? I just remember, like, I had, we had hired a gentleman that worked in our activity department that had really long hair, and he was mandated to wear it in a ponytail every single day, and that was not his norm, you know, so it's one of those things that you think about, obviously, change is good, and culture change has really helped with that, but we now we need to take it that step further, and be more culturally diverse, and allow I love what you said about allowing even people that maybe have some physical limitations or anything like that, you know, that they need to be in our communities so that we can add that intercultural relationship. And Pam, thank you so much for bringing up the scholarship because I was going to I was going to touch on that because we are in the open enrollment period right now for the cultural diversity scholarship. This is a scholarship that's available for people that are in a cultural diversity background. You can read all the read all the stipulations on the website, 
but this is a scholarship that's up to a thousand dollars that can help further education and the open enrollment period is only open till january 31st so that's next wednesday so we're just less than a week and then it reopens again in june so this enrollment's been open in january and june and we've had a few people take advantage of it and we haven't had we've had some uh, enrollment periods that we've had nobody apply so it's really sad because this is something that is huge that nap wanted to do you know instead of just putting like you say just putting a poster up saying we support everybody we're taking the action to show that we really do support everybody so i hope that those of you that are watching you know can really really look at that and i love what vicky just says here i really want to point this out she says um, in Frontier, Monda Montana. So Vicki, welcome. Welcome from Montana. She says it's sometimes very difficult to incorporate cultural diversity because we don't have the wide population like other areas. Do you have any suggestions on how to substitute those experiences for us? Ooh, good question. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I think education is is always important. So um, if you don't have that population, you don't have that staff to represent someone, education is also um, very important. You can do activities around different cultures. Um, we do a lot of you know, um, African festivals, um, Caribbean festivals, just to learn about the culture. Not saying that necessarily we have that population, but really just to learn about people, you can do an activity based around their foods and um, you can do like a armchair travel, you know, little things like that really open up to discussion about someone's culture. Um, so I think that that would be a good start if you don't have you know that representation there for that diverse and culture. Two, if there's a way you can, you know, because I was thinking about this when Diamond was talking about making sure that your staff is diverse and giving people opportunities. Oftentimes, the, the problem is the lack of cultural knowledge and sensitivity with residents. Um, and, you know, the things that some of our staff have to experience are so unpleasant and unneeded. And so how do we, how can we train our or you know, educate our residents. And then along with that too, if you're in a very you know, um, homogenous community, just look at what's happening out in our world right now. I mean, you know, I live in Minneapolis. We went through the George Floyd um, experience and trauma. And so you know, having current event groups with residents and trying to get them to talk about, do you understand why this is happening and how people feel and, you know, I don't have the answers. I've been saying this for four years, but I want to learn more. I want mm -hmm. to do better and figure out how to do that. And you know, if that is something that we could help our residents do also, that is meaningful activity. To me, that's building a community and doing something really therapeutic, you know, no matter if you're 90 or if you're 18, you know. So um I think we can think about this in a lot of ways, you know, than than just um, you know, the the resident who may be from another culture or that sort of thing, of how we really build our communities to be equitable, safe places for everyone to live and work. There's so many trainings that can be done virtually now, which is really helpful if you want to bring in an expert or um, you can go, I think, to the NAP library and there's going to be some education there. We have a small library at the front of our facility and we just made it the goal to get as much diversity as we could in the books that were there so that people can be reading about all different other kinds of culture and people. And that has been really, really successful. And oftentimes you can get donations for something like that. Love that. Well, Florence shares, she says she's in Virginia. Our community has a wide range of staff from all over the world. A large majority of residents are from the local area and they love hearing the staff's stories and cultural experiences. The educational aspect can easily go both ways. So thank you, Florence, for sharing that tip. I like that, that tip a lot. And I love this. Sierra says, I was so worried about working with blue hair, but I've been thankful that my new facility has been supportive of me looking and being different. It also helps residents remember who I am. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then she goes on to share, too, that she has so many residents who speak only Spanish and a few who speak only English. And it's difficult sometimes to engage in both languages or keep activities engaging for people who only speak one language. Ooh, that, that can be definitely challenging. And I know something that we did, and I don't, I don't want to, like, support segregation, but we did have groups that were Spanish only, and then we had the groups that were English only so that you wouldn't have to run in to that confusion. And I know that our Spanish speaking groups 
really appreciated that because then they were able to like really immerse in the language and not have to worry about somebody speaking English over here or, or Spanglish, you know, sometimes happens too. I like that com combination of the two. And I think that's really important too, to, to talk about that. And I love this Linda kind of commenting on what you said, um, Pam, I believe that you need to present news current to them so that they realize that they're not in a vacuum and find out where each resident was looking at that. And a Heidi from Honolulu, I love this too. She says, Hawaiian culture is something very different. Coming from the continental US, I really had to immerse myself and learn how to recognize different holidays, also including more Asian culture, foods, customs, and traditions. It all came from talking to our residents. And luckily I have a great support with the admin team. Absolutely, Heidi, yes. All of these things are really, really good too to recognize and understand. And Vicki goes on to say that they also do like armchair travels where we have started using more traveling staff from other ethnicities to help expose residents and community staff. So that's a start too. I like that. Thank you so much. And I know one of our other partners, Wowzitude, they did the, the trip to Ireland this morning, the virtual trip to Ireland this morning. And if you watch that, everybody that watched it was able to get a one month free uh, subscription to Wowzitude. And they do, they do a free they do two tours every week that are to two different nice. countries. So it's very cool, you know, to have that ability to just kind of check that out. You know, instead of watching a YouTube video, those tours are interactive. And so I think all of these are all of these are great comments. And so I just think, you know, <clears throat> as we kind of wrap up our time together, I really think it's important that we recognize people are all different. Everybody comes from a different background, culture, belief system. Um, and we have to recognize all of that when we come into play. And that is why at NAP, we've been really supporting activity professionals, life enrichment directors, and we've been really working hard to help get the staffing standards different, you know, for us, you know, because we recognize there may only sometimes be one of us. And we don't want to, you know, it's hard to do 100 different programs for 100 different residents when you're one of you. And I like what Diamond said, too, is, you know, take those things, but also realize Let's put this together too and have this opportunity to create to create experiences together, to talk about each other, to, to look at current events, to study and focus and be more culturally sensitive. And, you know, we're getting into the baby boomers and I think that we'll see a little bit more, less stress, you know, of, of that, but there's always going to be, I was just seeing an article on LinkedIn today, there's always going to be racism, sexism, ageism, all of these things are going to be still in our communities and we can only be that culture of change. That's what we need to do is create that culture of change. And so I want to thank you ladies and our other members of our cultural competency committee who weren't able to join us today. So thank you so much for your time and your commitment to help support NAP move forward in the right direction, because that's what we want to do is to be able to move forward in that, that direction. And so thank you again. Any uh, uh, food for thoughts or final words of wisdom? Uh, move past that fear of making a mistake. Uh, ah. Get as much education as you can. Thank you. And apply I like that. Move past your fear. <laughs> Sorry, Pam. So what'd you say? I, I apologize. apologize. And apply for a scholarship. You know, particularly yes. if you have a staff <laughs> person you yes. want to, you know, move up the ladder, things like that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, we've had a good group of people in here, and Linda, I just saw your question come in. She wants to know what type of training is available now each one of the states is there a certificate that's offered and so Linda if you want to leave your email address here in the chat and we will be happy to reach out to you and discuss that further and get you connected to the resources that are in your state so we'd be happy to do that Linda so please drop your email in the in the chat there or you can send it private message if you prefer um, so I know that we've had we've had a good group of people on so thank you so much for your conversations and also we have a, a winner to announce, right? So I think it's super important that we, we get to that point. Again, we have the engagement premier bundle that is being offered. It's a $6,000 uh, membership for one year to Spiral 100, Coral Health, Memory Bio, Fotavia, One Day University, and Discover Live. And so let's roll it out. So let's give a little do 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 And our winner is Kara Knowles. So congratulations, congratulations, Kara, you are the big winner and we will be reaching out to you via email to help you claim your prize. So hopefully Kara, you're watching and congrats on winning. And we look forward to that. 
And yes, Nicole, do the same thing. Send your, send us your email and we will do the same for you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you again, ladies, for your time today. Thank you. Diamond, did you have any last thoughts? Oh, I'm any, sorry. I, I feel like Pam and I went and I just wanted oh, to give you yeah. a chance. No, no, it's okay. I feel like You're everyone good. really sums it up. It's just my, my main thing was just really just educate one another. Um, use your staff to the best of your advantage because they have so much to offer. And inclusion also means people with disabilities and, and really, um, and really take it all in and really educate one another. I think it's the best way moving forward. It's a good start. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Is a, that's the best final words of wisdom that we could have. So thank you so much okay. for, for your thoughts, Diamond. And thank you for being a part of our, thank you. our council here. All thank right, everybody, you. take care. And we'll see you again tomorrow. We have our final webinar with Activity Connection. And we will be Activity Connection will be also offering some more prizes. So if you're not registered for that, go to the website on NAP dot info under the education tab, live webinars, and you'll be able to register there. I also put the... Uh, link to the application for the diversity advancement scholarship in the chat. So please check it out if you're interested. All right, everybody take care and we'll see you Thank tomorrow. You. Thanks, Alisa. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.